So, um, yeah, it's open. Yeah. Perhaps the last one. Is it possible only to no, it's only <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will just start uh, talking to her now. Dr. Dr. Wakayami, thank you for uh, doing the Skype from, uh, from Japan. I know you couldn't make it here because of the typhoon. Uh, so I will give you now the floor and so we will be able to hear you. Okay, go. And then you can you share your screen, okay? For the PowerPoint. Okay. The floor is yours. Thirty minutes. Thank you. Yes, but can you put my, the small screen from my, where you, you show me to the right? I close that, yes. yes. Okay. okay, excellent, perfect. Okay. Go. Because the Aerospace experiment is too 
and difficult to get acceptance about NASA Android search. So we used a picture with rest device, 3D Kinesan. This was a 3D Kinesan device. And we examined with our mouse embryo can and mouse embryo photography. This machine that rotates and contract the gravity of the Earth. We have a three questions. Why is the fertilization? Is it possible to fertilize without gravity? And is it possible to develop the process without gravity? And the third question is, is it possible to produce oxygen from these embryos? So, we have a result. As fertilization was possible without reduced success rate. And this was embryo development. And the development rate of the two cell stage was the same between 1G and micrography. But plus this stage rate was significantly reduced when embryo culture in micrography. And we can um, compare it of the cell number of our blastocyst. This was mouse blastocyst stage picture. Blue and uh, green is a TE cell. TE cell for future grown up with placenta. And red is the ICM. ICM grown up with body. So we counted the cell number of this. When embryo was culture under the microgravity, number of TE cell. The E cell were significantly reduced compared to 1Z. So, we tested the production of oxygen without microgravity. This is the birth rate graph. Under microgravity, the birth rate decreased significantly like this. From these results, this result suggests that the normalized reproduction in this space may differ compared to other species. This picture was wrote by a paper, Japanese paper. They said one couple said uh, they want a baby, but impossible on the other plan. But however, this was a simulation experiment, not real. So we must confirm to using space station. However, there is a lot of limitation to perform mammalian reproduction experiment in space. One is difficult to bring live animals to space because animals living from a branch and microgravity cause to very high stress for animals and difficult to bring live gamete embryo to space. Embryo can culture only four days, so if plant the embryos, it's okay. Case there won't be necessary, so it's difficult to bring up. And third, it's difficult to bring frozen embryo to space because astronauts cannot handle the frozen embryo because embryos are very small and a lot of brain is required. This picture is the sesame. And mice outside. Mouse embryos diameter is only 80 micrometers, so it's difficult to handle, handle necessary the special scale. But we appeal with a real space project to NASA. We will launch mouse to save frozen embryos, and astronauts will sow and culture the embryo in space station. At least. Our proposal accepted. <coughs> so our plan is early mammalian embryogenesis and microgravity in space. I from now I introduce. This is ongoing our theme. Our theme is first plan is land to the embryo. Uh, so we think embryo will inside hollow fiber tube. The membrane this tube
Because problem one is not Embryo and it could develop the brassis shall experiment person necessary, not necessary. No necessary special experiment. This picture is a blastocyst embryo mass embryo to using new device and this was a uh, stained blast cyst using this new device. Also, we have uh, many improvements necessary. This project will be performed at the next August, next year August. We will know whether mammalian embryo can develop the blast cyst without a gravity by this using this device. So they, now we are continue this experiment. Anyway, so I introduce next project about the space pack project. This project is a weather space radiation case B cell damage to the sperm DNA or not. Why use sperm? Because it is for us. This was a space pack decal. Because previously we developed new sperm preservation method in which mouse sperm were freeze dried and stored at room temperature in 1998. This was powder sperm. At the bottom of white is a sperm powder sperm. And after fraud sowing, all sperm was dead, cannot move. But and cell membrane was broken. But, however, when those sperm were injected into the mouse oocyte like this, we can obtain healthy pups of sperm from this dried sperm just as water. And freeze drying sperm can preserve the room temperature even stored one year. This was a freeze dry sperm preserved in the desk drawer, like this. And we can obtain many, many parts from this sperm. The birth rate did not decrease with increased pre pre preservation period. This paper was published the last year. And we have a merit of freeze dried sperm. So, freeze dried sperm. One is Oops. One is do not require rigid nitrogen, and one is very small size, only 10 centimeters, and very high weight. 
and handle is easy. Just keep on ISS. Can you hear? Yes, I can hear. Yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. yes we can hear. Yes, I'm returning back. Hello? Hello? Can you continue? Uh, can is, is your presentation finished or can no, no, you no, continue? No, no, no. You can continue. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Yes. Sorry. This was a space. No, cannot move. Are you okay? Okay. So, using this freeze dried sperm, mouse sperm were preserved in the International Space Station for six years to know the effect of space radiation into spam DNA. This project can be done only when only when freeze dry spam were used because freeze dry spam do not require the liquid nitrogen. So in 2009 we appealed this project to JAXA and then it was candid to tame. Right. This thing. This was uh, our tema. Like this. So, to make this, to do this experiment, we preparation the freeze dry spam, many many freeze dry spam, to launch. About over two thousand amperes we prepared, and we check the lot, and select the best spam, and pack the boxes. Three boxes in launch up to space and three boxes onto the earth is a control, earth control. These are real boxes picture. Uh, each box container is 48 amperes and detection of the amount of space radiation patch, radiation patch, this one, and Three boxes were launched to an international space station using Japanese rocket. This was packing work. This was carry into rocket. And 2013, we launched this from Tanegashima space station. So, after nine months, first box was returned to the Earth. This picture was the damage, check the damage. We check the damage of each ampers against ranch, storage, and return to us. We are examined almost, so almost all ampers had no damage. This was a radiation patch. Amount of radiation was one times higher than ground, Japan. This was the result. DNA damage of space preserved spermatozoa. We examine uh, comet assay. DNA double strand break on sperm head was slightly increased during space preservation. And result two, DNA damage on repairing of zygote. This was gamma ATX. We stained gamma ATX to the marker of the DNA damage. Uh, DNA damage of male pronucleus delivered from space spam were slightly but significantly higher than round space round spam. Uh, result three production of offspring from space spam space preserved spam were injected in fresh oocyte by micro manipulator. We can obtain space pups. 
This was the world's first mass delivered from the space preservation spam. This is a birth rate graph. We bring the four strain mice. Although the birth rate was decreased from the original control is just after made, but this was ground things and this was space. There are no difference between ground and space. And result four is uh, we analyze NGS analysis. The results suggest that there are no difference between space and ground pups. Now, all samples were returned to the Earth. We published this paper and box one, nine months reservation. Already we published in 2017, our paper was published. Now, three years preservation and six years preservation box was returned to the 2016 and the 2019 this year. By this experiment, we will know the effect of space radiation to the sperm DNA, whether the offspring are mutant or not. So, from this experiment, we think preservation of genetic resources. When disaster on the Earth, like typhoon, happened, genetic resources will lost forever. So, how to protect these genetic resources on the Earth? I think freeze dry is the best because freeze dry is very useful. When major disaster on the earth was happened, it is saved and genetic resources to store another planet or satellite. And it will be low cost because freeze dry is very small. It carried frozen spam and fertilized eggs than to carry live humans and animals to another star. This is a very famous novel, the George R. Martin's Tough Voyage. This novel set the preservation of the uh, Earth animals on the space ship. I think this is a good idea, but it was thought as a science fiction like this. But this is our paper in 2009. A 2017 PNS paper, we said, we mentioned that the underground of the moon is the best place for planet spam preservation, permanent spam preservation in the event of the Earth, uh, Earth re disaster. And good timing, after we published, large lava tubes were found on the moon. So, if you use those lava tubes and the ground the moon, it can be preserved as genetic resources. So, how about tolerance of freeze dry sperm? We found that freeze dry sperm is very useful to preserve genetic resources in space. However, we have to know the limitation of the tolerance of the freeze dry sperm. We think it is known that mammalian species has no tolerance against extreme environment, not like tardigrade, this one. Tardigrade against 100 degrees and vacuum and ultra low temperature when dry. However, our results suggest that the mammalian nucleus DNA rather than cells has a strong tolerance to examine environment as like tardigrade. So we examine the effect of the frequent temperature changes and high temperature to the freeze dry sperm. This is a result of the examination. We examine the tolerance against frequent temperature change. From this experiment, the nuclei of the freeze dried mass sperm of the sewer exhibit a strong tolerance frequent temperature change between room temperature and minus 30 degrees, even liquid nitrogen degrees, this one. We can obtain puffs from this. And next, tolerance against high temperature. We put the freeze-dried sperm into the oven and 
we put the 95 degrees oven. But six hours oven in the 95 temperature, we can obtain pups, healthy mouse pups. The nuclear freeze dried mouse from the zoo exhibit strong tolerance to high temperature. And next, we try to over 100 degrees tolerance. So from this experiment, this one, 115 degrees freeze dried sperm was resisted to get the offspring. The freeze dried sperm nucleus is tolerant to the temperature more than 100 degrees for a short period, which is better than tolerance shown by tardigrade species. This result was published this year like this. Thus, our results suggest that when considering the sperm nucleus DNA was the material that is used as a blueprint of life, rather than cell viability, significant tolerance to extreme temp temperature is present even in higher species, such as mammalians. So we think hypothesis about panspermia. Panspermia hypothesis is that life could have been seeded on the Earth via interplanetary object. However, weak point this hypothesis is uh, probably all organisms cannot survive after explore the high temperature and space radiation during the arrival to us. But from this paper, uh, we wrote this paper. We mentioned the panspermia hypothesis because this freeze dry sperm is a uh, explodes such as extremely environment. So we support this hypothesis. We think prospect of the next space experiment. International Space Station will support suspend it at year 2024. Then, Lunar Gateway will be built on lunar orbit. However, the Gateway is small and astronauts will not stay every day. What kind of experiment can we do it here? I think freeze dry is the best effect of the deep space radiation to gamut, gamut uh, gateway provide us the deep space radiation which is much stronger than International Space Station. The space radiation will change the DNA sequence and cause natural mutation. Usually those DNA damage were repaired, but if accumulated during several generations, which are through the have been the driving force for evolution of organisms, like these novels. We will apply the gateway experiment next stage. When sperm were preserved on the moon or gateway, so the sperm were exposed to the deep space radiation, which is very strong, but very natural. So the sperm will help us to clear the mystery of the life or evolution of the organism. In addition, it will promote the improvement animal breeding by increased natural mutation. Thank you very much. Very thank you very much for our laboratory members and a special thanks for Professor Flores and Dasha. Please, if you have some question, please email this this address. We will certainly do this. Thank you so much for uh, your excellent presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much again from uh, from Japan, uh, from Europe to Japan. I will now give the word to uh, Jeffrey Alberts, the master of the chair of this uh, session of procreation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, just so that uh, I can forecast a little bit. Um, this was a session that um, sustained some, some uh, perturbations and change. Uh, clearly, the, um, the typhoon in Japan uh, altered this presentation. And we didn't get uh, the, the physical presence of the speaker. Um, the next speaker is, is um, 
that were scheduled uh, could not make it either. So we're um, going to jump ahead to the third speaker, and who I'll introduce in one moment. And um, that that presentation will be um, uh, about 10 minutes longer, it's the way we've scheduled it, than uh, you have in your program. And then there'll be a uh, I'll follow with the um, the third and final presentation before the the roundtable. So uh, I have the pleasure of. Um, Introducing Dr. Egbert Edelbrook, um, who I've just met and had a, a short and, and fascinating discussion with him, uh, learning that um, he has tremendously diverse training um, with expertise in, um, in biomedicine, uh, legal aspects, and ethical aspects of, um, of science and, and applied science. And he has um, founded a, um, a company, as you know, um, Firstborn, Sorry? Spaceborn. Spaceborne, yes, in the Netherlands, um, and he will um, uh, speak to you about uh, their vision and their work. Oh, and I guess um, among his his, um, his noteworthy uh, credentials that he shared with me is that uh, not only does he have this extensive background in uh, these uh, related disciplines, but he's also a, um, a sperm donor. Testing. Yes, perfect, thank you. So this is um, hopefully the next uh, location for the Asgardia Congress. This is where we do, uh, where we coordinate part of our research in the city of Eindhoven in the south of ne Netherlands, where we have a small office where we uh, do some of the research. What do we do? We research the conditions for uh, reproduction, repro human reproduction in space. Uh, we focus on assisted reproductive technology, ART. And we translate the outcomes uh, to mission designs and to biomedical equipment required for those missions. So we have to deal with uh, different, uh, different challenges, of course, biomedical uh, matters, uh, space technological matters, and of course, the ethical and legal matters. And of course, uh, we need a lot of experts to help us with that, and we are very happy with the support of many people. I'm not going to into much detail. I'm very happy with 10 minutes extra, making 20 minutes, but not enough to uh, go through all the details of the support that we have. So let's just skip to uh, the different challenges that we deal with. Um, when we're talking about space, we, we're talking about different environments. Low Earth orbit is totally different from uh, beyond the magnetosphere, uh, for example, on the Moon or on the surface of Mars. We are focusing step by step, and we're focusing on low Earth orbit. And uh, when we're talking about reproduction, um, that's a, a, a big total of many stages, and we are uh, step by step um, going through those stages, and we're First, looking at conception and early embryo development. There's quite some overlap, actually, with uh, what uh, Dr. Wakayama is doing with her colleagues, but we'll go through it uh, during the presentation. Uh, next, please. Um, a big important difference is uh, we're, we're not dealing with, with human intercourse in space. We're not ready for that yet. So we are focusing on, on assisted reproductive technology, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm not, I don't have to explain all the, the challenges that have been mentioned already about uh, the gravity differences and the radi radiation exposure that we're dealing with. So let's move on to uh, the next slide. Um, this is a lot of details about, if, if you look at all those different areas in space and all those different stages of reproduction, each match will uh, create new scientific research questions. Uh, so it's creating a big puzzle and we're just handling e each piece of the puzzle at, 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 at a time, starting with, um, as I said, um, conception and early embryo development but within a variation of gravity. So um, I'll explain that later. And we're, the name is already uh, uh, revealing that we're all also looking at um, 
childbirth in space, space born united, also in low Earth orbit. So that's more, of more or less at the end of the puzzle. Next, please. When that is successful, we will also be looking at other elements of uh, assisted reproductive technology in our uh, view that provides many uh, solutions for uh, reproduction in space, uh, but one piece at a time. Oh, this is really fast. Um, not sure this is real. Sorry. Just one, one back, I think. And one more. Yes. So, paving the road to procreation in space, but there are obstacles. Um, why is uh, NASA or JAXA or ESA or even SpaceX, why, why is it difficult for them to accelerate this, this life science domain? Um, there are some challenges for the big agencies, uh, especially the taxpayer money issue. It's hard to sell projects that have a long-term goal, longer than some 10 years. And reproduction in space, all those different stages will take maybe 25 to 30 years. So that's hard to sell. And it's even uh, harder to sell if it's a, a controversial... Uh, oops. A controversial theme like, like reproduction in space, dealing with delicate uh, babies and, and vulnerable pregnant women. So, of course, that's, uh, that creates a, a political explosive potential of, well, taxpayer money being spent on research in space. We are very happy with uh, Dr. Leyendecker. He's also one of our consultants. He did his uh, research on human reproduction in space, supervised by NASA. So this is first-hand information. Um, we, something that's also difficult, if Obama wants to go to Mars, Trump needs to do something else, so he says we first need to go to the moon. So this alternating policy is also creating budgetary problems for the, for the agencies, making long-term projects even more difficult. And they explicitly mention that they would like uh, individual focused companies to address these issues, and they will support it. So they seem to be happy with initiatives like ours. So back to this first focus, how do we do this? How do we look, how do we uh, research conception in low Earth orbit? Of course, we benefit a lot from the life science that already has been done by the different groups like uh, Dr. Wakayama or uh, ESA and NASA and other groups. And there are different challenges related to this research. Um, and we're talking about a four to five days missions and we're not only looking at uh, missions on board ISS or um, subsequent uh, vehicles we're also looking at options in, in um, dedicated flights in a recoverable satellite but I'll continue about that later so we have also logistical challenges like Dr. Wakayama explained you need very late access to your uh, space vehicle because uh, otherwise you cannot uh, handle the cell samples any longer. But if you use dedicated flights, for example, um, uh, Virgin Orbit, uh, they have the Launcher 1, you can have access a few hours before launch. If you have your equipment built inside a few days before, and you have a biocassette with your cell samples to insert at the, a few hours before, you can work on a different way. So we are developing um, existing technology that is used on Earth every day in, in many IVF clinics. And as um, uh, per the professor explained, I'm a donor myself, so I've also from that role, I learned a few things about IVF technology, specifically about this device. This is an example of an embryo incubator um, where every individual embryo is, div is, um, is monitored with a separate camera and you can follow uh, 12 individual embryos. So this is a live support system, and we're using it. We are re-engineering this device to uh, apply in space. So we know what, um, what is needed in space. We know the, the different challenges in space. Um, and we are, but the device that is used in IVF clinics every day is never designed, of course, for um, uh, 
small volume or light in mass or low in energy consumption. So we have to optimize the devices uh, for that before we can use them in space. And also, we uh, add a few functionalities. Um, we also work with, uh, we, we want to include artificial gravity because uh, we also want to find out will the embryos develop in a healthy way, for example, in a Mars-like gravity level. So that is essential if we want to have human settlements on Mars. We, we need to know, will embryos develop in a healthy way on that gravity level? And we can research that on a cost-effective method just uh, close to Earth in low Earth orbit. Uh, we also include uh, cryo storage. After five days, we, we, we uh, fix the cell samples. We deep freeze them, like in cryo stage also to, to handle the, the G-force peaks it, uh, during re-entry and the shakings. Uh, we have different uh, groups that can benefit from uh, our research, of course, on the really long term, the, the space tourism, uh, the, the, the industry focused at uh, human settlements beyond Earth, but also the space tourism uh, industry, because they are afraid of uncontrolled conceptions in space. The space tourism could be a magnet for uh, in the upcoming nations in the space race to claim this unique uh, achievement to have the first uh, baby conceived in space. Um, China wants the first woman on the moon. Elon Musk wants the first human on Mars. Well, some country would be attracted to have this achievement of having the first baby born in space or, or conceived in space. So. It's better to, to um, be ahead of that and, and um, research it before. And, and um, I don't have time to go really deep into this. Um, we also uh, use, um, we, we also have to mitigate the radiation problems. And we uh, learn a lot from uh, different research centers who are dealing with it. And we are focusing on um, uh, cell treatments, radiation resistant, uh, resistance enhancement. And a very easy one, just natural selection, using cell samples from people who have a natural higher radiation resistance. Um, so what would be the output of a, of a research platform like that, a device like that? Uh, we can validate uh, cell enhancement treatments. Uh, we can also check other animals, other mammalians, and, and, and uh, find out which one will, will uh, live in a healthy way, which, which embryos can develop in a healthy way in different gravity environments. Um, and many other details, which I will skip for now because of the time. Uh, but what, what expertise is needed to make a device and a research platform like this? I mentioned already the, the domains that we, uh, that we have to work with, the different challenges. I won't go into a lot of details, but you can imagine uh, in the engineering fields and in the biomedical fields, in the space technology area, and of course the ethical and legal areas, these are the kinds of research questions that we're dealing with and the, the types of experts and, and university uh, and industry partners uh, that, that we work with. Um, and altogether, this is our overview, which is maybe a little bit boring for now. So um, options to, uh, uh, as I told you already, we're really interested in, in um, um, recoverable biosatellite approaches, which is a little bit complicated because the re-entry devices, the, the, the way back is, is uh, really difficult, um, which is easier if you go on board ISS. But on the other hand, the, the test complexity and the, the, the regulations are, are um, more elaborate when you go on board ISS because you could compromise other experiments, etc. Um, and then, really good, um, nice advantage of, for example, uh, Virgin Orbit um, is that their plane they can go to any country. Uh, also, in terms of uh, legislation, where legislation is slightly more beneficial to us, we can ask the plane to go there. Um, so that's what we hope uh, to work with eventually because that's also providing very late access uh, for our cell samples. Um, let's just continue with, oh, I already mentioned the, the space race uh, issue. We, we sometimes get uh, information requests from, from Qatar lately, we, we got one. 
we are not very eager to, to um, continue with that because we want to do this on a very ethical, ethically uh, respectable way. Um, but looking at the space tourism that might come in the next 10 or 15 years, there is some urgency to deal with these matters. Uh, we are called Space Born United because we're also designing mission uh, where a pregnant woman uh, can actually give birth to uh, a child. We are not talking about nine months of pregnancy in space. We are only talking about a 24-hour, maybe 36-hour mission. Um, and this is only possible um, for now in low Earth orbit. And it is only possible thanks to a very... Um, a thorough selection procedure. Uh, one of the elements, for example, is that uh, participants would have to um, uh, have experience in, in delivery already twice, completely flawless. So they, they have a personal experience that even the second delivery was much more fluent and the third one will be even more fluent. Uh, many other uh, aspects like natural higher radiation resistance also for these participants. Um, you can induce the, constraint, the, 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 the labor process um, like they do in IVF clinics uh, on a daily basis. So planning is of course an issue. Uh, you, it, it's hard to plan a natural process like this and if there's something uh, wrong with the weather or the delay, the, the launch of the, the space vehicle is delayed, you have to deal with that. So we, will not, we, we, can, we could never work with just one pregnant woman. We would have maybe 30 uh, participants and they could step out at any moment because otherwise ethically it's not, not even possible. But the experts that we work with, they... Uh, I, I have five minutes, perfect. The experts that we work with, they believe, and I believe, that this is possible uh, at a lower risk level than an uh, average Western-style uh, delivery on Earth. And that would be the only way to, to make this possible. We're not really planning this, we're, we're looking at it, we're focusing on the, on the embryo development, on the conception in space, but we, are all, we, we have to look at this as well. Um, we, we are called Spaceborn United, uh, because we think this, this is another step in our evolution, and that should not be a Western white people thing, of course, that should be uh, a global thing, with, uh, which includes many uh, nations and groups and races and religions, etc. Um, so we would hope to mix. Um, we would hope to 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 mix the the staff and the participants, and 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 inc so we 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 could have a a Japanese uh, doctor on board, and an uh, American uh, assistant, and um, an Indian woman giving birth. So we we would like to mix as as much as much uh, groups as possible. So there are many challenges uh, in, in this mission as well. Um, but looking at the time, I don't think I should go into it too much. The biggest uh, challenge uh, we're still working on is, is gravity peaks. During launch, you have some stage separation explosions that give some uh, G peaks. Um, ju just microseconds, so it's not Probably not, not a, a too big of a deal, but still we have to, to, uh, to find a way to, to make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, we, we benefit from um, the developments in the space tourism sector who are trying to make really comfortable uh, space vehicles. Not just the military style trained people, but also uh, normal people like, like we maybe can take uh, part in those. Uh, um, let's continue. Uh, next please. Uh, next, please. Oh. Um, the uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation has been testing uh, the, the Dream Chaser, cargo version, personnel version, and this would already be an option that could work. We would, of, of course, uh, like to, to work with, with the best, uh, the, the, uh, the best uh, space vehicle with a, a better G profile 
the, the dream chaser um, should be able to stay under uh, three G's at all times during launch and re-entry. So, but that we, we think that's still too much for a pregnant woman or a, a newborn baby. But there's progress and we're monitoring the developments of the space tourism sector and Sierra Nevada Corporation. So eventually we will uh, hope to do this in about 10 to 15 years. Another option would be uh, on board um, ISS or an alternative like the commercial space station that uh, Bigelow is testing already. And in that way, we hope to contribute to uh, Asgardia. Uh, to, uh, we, are, we are committed to, to make their dream uh, come true. And I'd like to end with a quote of uh, Carl Sagan talking about our uh, seeds of life, which are the human reproduction cells uh, that have to spread into space. Thank you very much. chance to um, ask questions and discuss these uh, myriad issues that, that your very provocative talk raised. Thank you. So, um, would you keep time for me? Yeah, sure. So, give me a five minute. That'd be great. So, uh, I'll just repeat the thanks that uh, you've heard, uh, but they are heartfelt to um, be able to contribute to this really exciting meeting. and. Um, and for me, this was um, an instant uh, introduction to Asgardia. Um, I, I was so focused on just the, the event of coming to a, a space-based conference. There was actually going to be an afternoon session on procreation in space. It's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to, um, to share uh, my thoughts and, and, uh, and data um, with an audience on that topic because NASA um, after a, a, a wonderful phase of, of exuberant support for developmental biology in space, um, changed course, and um, there was suddenly next to no support for um, for these endeavors. So things got very, very quiet. So um, when Flores, when you first um, uh, made it, reached out to include me, um, I, I was just astonished because all this. But what more could one ask for now to have a chance to talk to a, an audience about it? So I appreciated it. And then I came and had this um, short but really stimulating conversation with Florist in the first evening. And I, um, as I confessed to you, I started thinking very differently about my talk. And so I'm going to um, have there'll be some facets. So the data have stayed the same. I'm not changing the data. But um, the way I want to frame the data and, and share my, my feelings about it with you has, has altered significantly, and it would be fun to, to, um, to do that and to get your feedback. Um, so shall I um, change the slides verbally? Is that the idea? Next slide, please. No? OK. Um, to, again, for full disclosure, the, um, the initial invitation for this presentation went to uh, Dr. April Ronka, who's a um, a good friend and, and a, a longtime collaborator of mine. She's um, currently a research scientist at NASA Ames. She was for years a, um, a postdoc in my lab, and during that, that phase in her career and mine, um, we had I, I brought her into a, a shuttle experiment, and she excelled and, uh, and also got the, um, got the bug and um, is now, um, as I said, a, a full-time researcher. Unfortunately, for April, she couldn't attend. Uh, the invitation moved down to me, and um, I'm here on her behalf. I, you know, I would have put her, t her name on the um, on the title, but I didn't have a chance since I changed my mind about this talk to um, to include her. But I just I do want to acknowledge her um, and many other people, of course. But uh, April's especially important. The next person to acknowledge is Konstantin uh, um a, a Russian rocketeer, uh, father of, of rocketry in, in uh, in Russia, um, an author, and um, famously uh, uh, stated that Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one cannot remain in the cradle forever. And this is a prescient, especially for, for this audience, an extremely prescient statement. It's been around for a long time. It's gotten lots of press, but I thought it was worth bringing up um, today um, for all the obvious reasons. I think it's wonderful that, that we have him and his, his quote here. So the, the, the issue of procreation in space that's, that's brought up with this, um, this quote and this vision um, 
has been around for a while, and it's actually one of the things that hooked me and, and many of us in uh, sort of traditional space biology um, with the idea of procreation in space because, after all, um, this is a, a, a standard textbook, uh, Spirals of Geologic Time. Um, we are used to thinking with great excitement and pleasure in a very academic way to start to appreciate the evolution of life on Earth and eventually the, the evolution of vertebrate life and eventually the evolution of sexual reproduction. And there are experts and thinkers and geologists and paleontologists and biologists, and many of us have been absorbed in, in this process. I, I would love to spend an hour <laughs> Um, unpacking this for you, but uh, very, very briefly, the uh, the basic notion is that mammalian reproduction, mammalian reproduction, which is I'm going to zoom down uh, and fast forward through time to mammalian reproduction as our topic, um, has been evolving, um, and, and our form of reproduction probably has been evolving, I think, for about 200 million years. It's a very, very fine-tuned uh, process and a very complicated one, as you'll see and have already heard. It involves internal fertilization, implantation, gastrulation, placentation, gastrulation, embryogenesis, parturition, giving birth, and lactation, just to name a few stages. And one can, in a very academic way, march through each of them and do our questions and tests, can this happen in space? Um, but um, I think that Asgardia, the, the ethos of Asgardia, and, and I think the, the culture of the times, is to start to adjust our approach because this, this minute step-by-step -step, uh, analysis could go on forever. And it's the, we're not going to wait. Um, that is, a, humankind will not wait entirely. So I think we have to adjust our thinking. Um, this is just, I, I'm going to skip by this slide, but this is roughly the time course I've been talking about in the evolution of reproduction. And uh, I'm going to skip this slide also and maybe come back to it, because this has been the growl for a long time, this notion of egg to egg to egg um, uh, as the, what we should be seeking, not just um, the kinds of experiments that I'll describe, but understanding um, the success or lack of success of mammalian reproduction using eggs that themselves were formed in space, but uh, maybe this will come up later. Um, <clears throat> so the question that, that we're going to jump to to is, is whether it can be mammalian reproduction and human reproduction. Can an Earth-evolved processes of mammalian procreation be successfully uh, expressed in, in, in extraterrestrial environments? And for us, I think now, uh, what we're doing is starting to fold in um, the real-life processes of microgravity exposure, uh, transition of, of exploration, moving through space, moving through substantial amounts of time, getting to another planet and setting up house there and anticipating that uh, beings will reproduce um, in the process somewhere along the line. So um, what do we know and what can we do and, and what questions do we ask? And it's going to come down to, in a, in a much more holistic way, a focus on um, us at, at these stages of our environment. Can the, the mother, infant, dyad, of course, and, and the whole reproductive cycle do it, but there'll be a special focus on the capability of this process encapsulated in this photograph taking place in a, in a satisfactory way and, um, and wondering about what the outcomes will be and what they, what's in store for, for all of us. Um, so let me now just turn to some uh, earthbound and, and, and low orbital uh, space experiments that pertain to this. And I'm going to be able to tell you in, in rat talk, in, in the experiments that have been done with non-human subjects, specifically Rattus norvegicus, uh, that have been flown, what little we know or how much we know, depending on how, how you want to do your emphasis. Um, and we're going to begin this with another set of Russian visionaries again who took, who took uh, charge um, years ago. In 1979, Cosmos 1129 was flown out of the then Soviet Union's unmanned satellite. Uh, they asked whether mammals can reproduce, namely can they copulate, fertilize, implant, go through gastrulation, placentation, and the beginning of embryogenesis in the microconditions of orbital flight. That experiment flew for about 18 and a half days from September 9th to, guess what, October 14th, 1979, 40 years ago today, Cosmos 1129 landed. 
first experiment. Um, the, the basic experiment, there was no video, um, no, no photography at all on this unmanned satellite. Basically, the, this, I could show you a, a pen and ink drawing of the habitat, but it was a large, large shoebox with a little automated dividing wall, five female rats on one side, two male rats on the other. Four days into the mission, the door was automatically retracted, and the magic of mammalian reproduction was um, supposed to occur. Um, it, as I said, it flew for 18 and a half days. That's several estra cycles um, worth of time, that, um, with using a four to five day cycle for estrus in, uh, in the female rat. So it was, it was a nicely designed experiment. It was also an unsuccessful mission. Uh, the, uh, 40 years ago today, the, the satellite was recovered. Uh, the animals were alive and well. There were no pregnancies whatsoever. Um, but it was not a failure of mammalian reproduction in space, we're pretty sure, because in fact, for quite remarkably, none of the ground control animals that were in the same uh, habitat on Earth got pregnant. So we don't think this was a space flight effect, but it was <laughs> a colossal failure in terms of the, the, uh, the goal of the experiment. So wonderful vision, it didn't happen. There are, this, this is a, a long, um, quite hot debate about what did or didn't happen. One explanation is that there was a light leak um, in both the ground habitat and the space habitat that disrupted the the, uh, the reproductive cycles and the ester cycles. That's just one explanation. It's actually a very complicated debate. So um, it was quite remarkable um, uh, and surprising result. And um, it spurred a, 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 an unfortunate kind of conservatism, I think, in both the, the Russians and uh, the US side. In fact, everybody who was participating in this international flight. And what I'll do is describe what's happened since then, but no one has tried this, six, this basic, simple, wonderful experiment um, since then. What's done, what was done instead is that um, both the, uh, the Russians, uh, the Institute for Biomedical Problems in, in, in Russia, Soviet Union, and at NASA have been flying a few times already impregnated rats and then studying the, the animals upon recovery. They're, uh, have not tried to have births of the, of the rats in space. Um, so the totality of the data that, that exists, and that I'll, I'll review very, very briefly for you, are from these five missions. There are these three missions. These, these are laid out against the, um, the reproductive, one phase of the reproductive cycle of a rodent, starting from gestational day one and going to oh, um, gestational day 22, 23, some people would say 21 and a half days. Um, of normal uh, gestation in, in a rat. And uh, there have been one, two, three missions, another Cosmos mission, two missions from NASA, these NIH missions I'll describe in a moment. And then there were two missions either on or associated with Neurolab, which were uh, designed to look at different aspects of postnatal development, again, in rats. So let's talk first about Cosmos 1514, because chronologically that was the next experiment. Um, oh, guys. I'm not going to do it chronologically. What I want to do is dispense with this first. These two um, uh, relatively recent Neurolab experiments, as I said, were for nursing animals. Um, it was done, I'm going to editorialize heavily right now because I wrote the minority report um, on the hardware. It was for lots of reasons. It was the, the effort was compressed. Um, there was a huge desire to fly this and fly it completely after all. It was Neurolab. Uh, the entire cargo bay of the space shuttle was set up as a beautiful laboratory that included these, these various habitats for, for these pregnant animals. And the, the PIs desperately wanted to run their experiments. And um, the fact is that the hardware wasn't ready, in my opinion. I, mean, I was in the hardware design business at that time, and I was, I was quite sure that um, it wasn't quite up to snuff. And the uh, NASA um, flew. Um, these don't project very well, but what they did is they refurbished the animal enclosure module, standard um, ancient box that would, had been used over and over again in different ways for flying rats, the AEM, and they also um, revitalized the, uh, the RAF, the Research Animal Holding Facility, and they gave them what they both called nursing configurations, and um, they flew on, um, on that 
uh, NIH R3, that, that preliminary mission, um, three ages, the, the, the postnatal day five animals succumbed entirely, and the, the postnatal day eights and fourteens, they were flown at these, these early birth um, ages, rather postnatal ages, uh, survived but did not do well. And in this other habitat, the, uh, the animals just simply didn't survive. Um, so it was very, very disappointing, and I think not entirely surprising to some of us, but it was a, a good effort. There were, I have to admit, there were some astonishing, wonderful things learned that we, we maybe will come up later in the conversation about the resiliency and the adaptation of these animals under these, these suboptimal conditions. I mean, the, there were videos, some video footage of them, and they did things that no young rat has ever done before to survive, the ones that did in terms of finding a mother's body while floating around and attaching to nipples and so forth. So it was, it was quite impressive, but um, there was too much stacked against them. So um, the totality of our data really come from, at least from my talk, from these, these, these other missions, that these are all prenatal. These are uh, animals that are impregnated on Earth and then flown. In the case of um, these two NIH missions, actually every single rat had a laparotomy uh, prior to flight, and we knew how many um, implanted sites she had in each uterine horn, so we would, could actually look at survivability, and we also could serve the needs of a, of a large number of investigators who we were all sharing the tissue and the, the organisms that came out of these, these matings. It was an extraordinarily beautifully orchestrated experiment, and many quite successful. So, but we'll start, as I said, with the, whoops, oh, this is really frustrating, with the, um, the Cosmos mission. So there are these three looks, Cosmos 15, 14. Here's the gestational days of, of 22 days, 13 to 18, quite short. And it was not because of the plan. It was planned to be longer. There were two rhesus monkeys in this unmanned satellite, the Cosmos satellite. One of them got out of its restraints early in the mission and started to disassemble the satellite from within. And there was a uh, decision to bring it down early. And they did that successfully. But uh, it, was, it was shortened the mission. And then these, these are the two shuttle flights, not Neurolab flights, but two shuttle flights with mid-deck lockers, uh, habitats, which was this unusual and, and wonderful collaboration between the National Institutes of Health in the States and NASA. They're therefore called NIH, Rodent 1 and Rodent 2. Those are the ones I'm going to be describing. Here's the, uh, the Cosmos uh, biosatellite that carried the animals. You saw photographs, I think, in Dr. Young's uh, presentation of the, the same uh, satellite. And um, it was launched in this, this Vostok rocket and manned again and then in the shuttle. And this is a little drawing in the deck locker. So Cosmos 1514 <coughs> um, launches 10 pregnant rats. They return to birth, uh, Earth, as I told you, uh, after 22% of the gestation period, uh, landing on gestational day nine. There were five fetuses, uh, and the dams were, were sacrificed at recovery, and, and then the dissections and the scrutiny of all their tissue began, and five more uh, traveled back to Moscow, um, and um, carried by Dr. Luba Sarova, who was the head of the, the rodent project there at the time. And um, uh, they were allowed to deliver vaginally, and in fact, four of them delivered successfully. There was one that did not, and there was one offspring that had uh, an enormous hemorrhage uh, in its head, and it blocked the birth canal, and that was an unsuccessful vaginal delivery. But basically, the animals had really quite nice deliveries. Um, poetically enough, they were delivered on Christmas Eve. Um, uh, at the end of that flight, I got a call that the uh, births were taking place. They were born in Building 10 of the Institute for Biomedical Problems at that time. And this is uh, some of the first space babies in, in Rodentia that, uh, to, that we had on Earth. And these animals and, and their, the rest of their counterparts and control animals, of course, underwent a series of sensory and motor uh, tests. And it was, um, we found the first evidence of uh, some altered sensory development, especially in vestibularly um, uh, mediated behaviors in these animals. And um, those showed up early in postnatal development. Um, and then the effects disappeared. Um, and they, they went to, to matching control animals within just a few days um, after recovery. These animals, as you can infer, were also on Earth and continued gestation for about four days before delivering. This was followed 11 years later by NIH R1. Uh, during those, that 11-year hiatus, where there was no such developmental biology flown or, or attempted, the Challenger exploded. That was a huge setback for, 
for everyone and, and um, both hearts and minds and, and plans. The International Space Station was established in, in that interval and its priorities and schedules and everything were, were vastly uh, different. That's the uh, hiatus. But then we did fly uh, NIH R1 and R2. We had, um, we had astronauts on hand, although, and they could pull out the mid-deck lockers and do some videos. There's lots of changes going on prenatally. And it's, it's a, a model of uh, one way or another of all vertebrate vestibular development. Um, as we did with the Cosmos um, uh, test, we did a standard test of, of what's called riding. You put an animal on its back, you hold it very gently on, on its chest with one finger or so. You release it and there's a reflexive writing response. They go back onto all fours. And it's actually a stereotype response. There's a corkscrew movement the animals show. It's age dependent. It can be, be studied very carefully and quantified nicely. As in um, the Cosmos experiment, this test, which is often interpreted as a vestibular test, the animals behave just like controls. But this is not, it's hardly purely vestibular. These animals are put on their back, they're held on their chest, they're um, they're manipulated, they have all these proprioceptive and cutaneous cues about being upside down on their backs. Um, so we also um, used a, a modification of this test, which is called a, a, a water drop test, in which we would take an individual pup, invert it very gently, um, but not touching anything, and then, as I can show you in this slide, I hope, at about this level in this body temperature um, tank of water, release it, Dive reflex takes place instantly. No water is aspirated. The animals do, can do just fine. They're just scooped out with a little fish net at the end. And they release at this level in here right after release as the animal is slowed down. So we can't do an airdrop at this age. But as it's slowed down by the, um, the viscosity of the water, this animal is starting to write. And by well before it gets down to the bottom, every animal will, will write itself and, and land on its flip all fours, so to speak. This column shows a flight pup who's been released exactly the same way, is not riding, and in fact, lands on its head. Stunning, exciting. Um, and we concluded at this point, these pups had read the textbooks. They have, have had, uh, a, functionally, a deafferentation of their vestibular input. Every sensory system that's ever been studied is sensitive to its own function um, during development. Function has been blunted, if not removed, in the vestibular system, we thought. Um, is the way everybody was sort of very reflexively speaking about it, so to speak. Um, and it was, it, it was the first time seen, but it was, it was not entirely shocking. It was what we wanted to see and, and we're expecting to see actually all along. Um, but again, quite exciting. So, um, but again, these are animals, and, and they, by the way, these animals then recovered two days later. They're showing normal riding under these conditions and, and, uh, and look just like controls. Um, but these animals also were on Earth for a couple of days before giving birth and before this, we, we ran the, were able to run this experiment. So NIH um, R2 came about two years later, and now we were able to remarkably, remarkably able to negotiate early access to the animals. So we're not going to wait with all the animals for two days for vaginal birth to take place. I'll, I'll say something maybe in, during the question period about these vaginal births. But, but in this case, we got the animals two hours after the shuttle hit the, the, the runway. Two hours later, they were in our lab uh, at the Cape, and um, we performed what we, April and I had been doing for years as part of the ground-based research. We've been studying prenatal sensory development, um, just in sort of the NIH context for a while and had used some fairly then innovative techniques and specifically what we were doing is doing a, um, a spinal a chemomyelotomy of the, the pregnant dam. So we would give an injection um, into the spinal cord and, and remove all sensation and, and movement from the point of the injection down. So we were able to have a, an insensate, actually if we kept the quiet in the room and turned down the lights, the rats would fall asleep while we were doing, the moms would fall asleep while we were doing the experiment. And we would make an incision, open her up, float out the baby, still attached to the placenta and the umbilical cord. As you can see right here, there's the umbilical cord and placenta. She's, these pups are attached to the moms. And they're placed into this little cup underwater, raised up very, very gently out of the water so we can have access to them. These little 
wires or heart rate electrodes that were implanted in them, and we can do sensory testing on them, and had done several years of, of analyses like this. And what we did in this experiment was included specifically the vestibular test that we'd been using, where we would tilt the pups under these conditions and use changes in heart rate and behavior. It's this, this enormous heart rate deceleration called an orienting reflex, which we had mapped out and quantified and you know, done all that the background work on, to be able to converse with these animals and say, can you feel this? And in this case, this is tilting them 70 degrees, the way that they would experience a mother in a laboratory going over to the wall, rearing up and going back down. And, and that was the, the duration and the extent of, of that activity. And what they told us was, oh, here's this is a, the mom rearing. Here's the pups in the, the cup being tilted. And what the pups told us was, these are the flight pups, these are their hearts, huge decrease in heart rate, enormous decelerations that we were seeing, and very sustained. Uh, they were telling us that, yes, I can detect this just fine. In fact, I can detect this more dramatically and better than the control animals at these ages. So now we have this crazy finding, wonderful finding, that when we do the first test that I described, which is a test designed to to uh, challenge the animals with a, a change, with presenting a linear uh, acceleration, turning them upside down and releasing them. They are hyposensitive. These pups are high, looking hypersensitive. Um, and, whoops, we had a little bit faster than we wanted to. Whoop, now we're going backwards. Um, and the, um, but when we looked more carefully at the, the test we're using, we realized that what, in this tilting test, we're not giving them a test of sensitivity to linear accelerations, we're actually giving them pr provocative angular acceleration. So perhaps what we're seeing are, is a hyposensitivity to the gravity receptor system and a hypersensitivity to the angular acceleration systems. Our colleagues on this experiment, uh, Bernd Fritsch and Laura Bruce, um, were doing the neuroanatomy. And these are, are counterstained um, sections of these, uh, of the, the brains of these animals. And um, let me just give you this, this quick summary slide, maybe. What it's showing you is that, um, again, we have this, these compromised or delayed responses to the linear accelerations, precocious or hypersensitive responses to the angular accelerations. And what the anatomy is saying is that we're seeing a preponderance of unbranched axons with growth cones presynaptics um, and the going to the, um, the, the medial ventral nucleus in the vestibular system. But remarkably, the number of synapses in that nucleus are the same in controls and in flight animals. So what this was showing us quantitatively is that the, the, ventral, the, the vestibular nucleus synapses, um, again, are the same in the flights and the controls. But what's happening is that that nucleus is being invaded by low numbers of a very uh, extremely high numbers of uh, synapses coming from the linear accelerations. Thank you. Um, and there's a very low number of the angular accelerators. Um, I'm sorry, a high number of the angular accelerators. So there's been a Darwinian competition at the level of the nucleus and the, the, uh, the angular accelerators are winning finally. I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go very quickly. And what I want to tell you is that we, we did a kinematic analysis of the mother's behavior during flight um, to see what, was, what the pups were experiencing in her. And what we found very briefly using this method is that the mothers in flight are rolling because they have six floors, essentially, and they go from floor to floor to floor, so they're, they're turning on their longitudinal axis. They are hyper-stimulating their babies in the rolling movement, which is the movement that where the, the, the pups are showing the, the accelerated response. I'm going to have to go on from that. So let me just, in one minute, just say that this is opening up, especially in the context of this meeting, um, reconstructions and re recognition of old, old data that um, are, are really quite becoming more and more exciting to me. And the notion is that I want to stop, and I think that we should consider no longer looking and asking questions about spaceflight and microgravity as being essentially a, a teratogen. And I think we've been doing space experiments as teratology experiments, looking for defects and monsters and breakdowns. And instead, what I'm suggesting that we do is take a look at the same data and look at other data that we have and start appreciating what we know about the development of the brain and behavior. 
and that the space environment is a different environment and we can start specifying ways in which it's different, whether it's with the mother or without, and that we can uh, start to appreciate adaptation in the positive sense and start to understand changes that are adaptive changes in those environments. And then there's going to be a dance in how we sculpt and monitor and, and manage these environments and the beings in them and start to appreciate the lawfulness of the outcomes. And I think it's, a, it's a, just a change in emphasis, but as soon as I started talking with you, Floris, about this, this, the implications of changing this emphasis just started to, to unfold in front of me. So very, do you mind if I just give you a couple minutes of this? Very quickly, this is from a, a beautiful paper that I, I have to share with you, and, and I'm happy to share with anybody here who's interested in it, by a guy named uh, Fred Previk, who uh, has done a, a I don't know him, but gosh, I've, I've read some of his work. It's just astonishing. And this 1991 review paper uh, is one in which he is looking at the development of laterality in the brain and handedness in, in different aspects. And this is one of the figures from this Previc paper in which he's showing the, the stereotyped orientation of a human fetus and, and just unpacks this in, in remarkable detail, saying that the shear forces that, that act on the the two uh, vestibular sets of vestibular receptors in the ears are unequal. And the stereotyped position is right ear out of a human fetus. This is, this is huge literature, it goes on and on in his analysis. But basically, he winds up arguing is that lateralization and handedness correlate and probably, he argues, derives from the differential shear forces that go act on the two vestibular, two sides of the vestibular system. And he compares it to this non-human primate, this baboon, which carries its babies differently and, and because of the way it ambulates, has equal shear forces on the, 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 the two vestibular organs. And in these animals, they do not have laterality and, and favor the handedness or footedness, in fact, which is a big part of the, the Previc analysis as well. It's a lovely paper, more than lovely, astonishing paper. Um, classic 1960s work by Heldon Hind, who um, raised kittens in the dark and then gave them visual experience um, in this field. And, the outcome was is that kittens that, whose visual experience was the same as the animal to whom it was yoked, but this animal on your right is sensing the reafferent feedback from each of its movements in, in corresponding to its visual input, and it develops a visual system and visual reactivity that is far superior. This animal who's seen the same things, but it's not coupled to its behavior and proprioception and the, the ways that the vestibular input has probably contributed doesn't develop the ability to, to see looming targets, to, to navigate visually through the world. Um, there are, there's a, a burgeoning literature from this, this very interesting summary by uh, Smith and, and Zhang on vestibular development to cognitive function, and they go through a, a quite large literature that goes obviously up until the, just into the 90s, arguing that um, there's evidence that, that there are vestibular systems to cognitive function. The, the bulk of that literature is linked to the hippocampus and hippocampal data for spatial memory, but it's a memory uh, analysis. This follows early work by Mike Podigal in the 70s, where he was doing visual uh, vestibular lesions and reporting memory deficits in maze learning in animals. This is a literature that's been all but forgotten, as far as I can tell, in this gravitational field. And I, I'm trying to, to have it come back and uh, at least tempt us and tantalize us a lot. Um, and that what they do, what Smith and Zhang do in this, this uh, is they go through these, these uh, cognitive disorders and memory deficits associated with vestibular lesions and vestibular dysfunctions of various kinds in animals and humans. They do a very nice job of, of working with the literature, dissociating the effects from the <coughs> secondary things for hearing loss and disrupted motor control and in humans, anxiety and depression that might be associated with it. And say that there are still changes which are worth noting, they integrate this with, um, with likely changes in the ascending pathways to the limbic system more generally, of course, including the hippocampus. I would include the cerebellum, Flores, I would include an insula as a place to look. Uh, it's just one of my, my uh, pleasures. And then they bring up a, a beginning literature around that time of, of uh, looking at galvanic vestibular stimulation of intact vestibular systems where they're augmenting, aug augmenting uh, this, this vestibular inputs and arguing that you get modulated cognitive function. I just think this stuff is delicious. It's just exciting and tantalizing. So I would just very briefly just like to reframe the issues a little bit, but I think that little bit of change in emphasis, as I said, opens things up really vastly differently and different way of thinking about this. And we should not be just looking for 
well, we've got this, this optimal adaptation, which isn't true, of course, to Earth, and anything that deviates from it is a, is a disruption and is a deficit, but instead we should go to developmental process and recognize it. And so we don't think about us as Earth normal, Earth typical being optimal. Uh, we don't, we, we drop this teratonergic perspective that microgravity produces anomalies and, and, and these are pathologies, and instead start to look at adaptive um, effects of spaceflight and altered G, short of, of course, radiation damage and, and things which are, are harmful to the animals. So I would suggest that we reframe the endeavor and expect that we should start to imagine defining what I would call, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but slightly not, the astro um, neurome. This is our brain and derived behavior that comes from being, exploring, and inhabiting uh, space. So this is the uh, neuroscience aspect of astrobiology as it should be. And I think this astro neurome is, could be a great adventure, and I think it's where we're going anyway, and I think we should recognize it and, um, and start to learn how to, um, to explore it. And uh, in doing so, I think it'll, it'll be rewarding, and, um, and maybe the, the way we will get into the future. So thank you very much. So I think we're going to break just for you can stand up, stretch, but don't go too far. We'll have a, a, a brief uh, moderated roundtable and, and, of course, invite your questions and comments and inspirations. Thank you so Being much. Pardon me? Being a president of conference. Yes, yeah, definitely. Would you also join the, um, please join the, the conversation, okay? So Flores was saying he's doing his presidential duties of, of moving furniture. Uh, and I think we should invite him to join us because I know he has lots to say and think. Thank you. Joining us uh, was really interesting. Hmm? Oh, okay. Your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So do we? Um, will we have a, a video participation as well? No. no, no, unfortunately not. It's too complicated. So it's beyond our technology today. You've got the three of us, and we have you. So please, questions or comments for um, any of the speakers and, and, uh, and our uh, meeting organizer. And okay, thank you for having me. So, shoot. Yes, sir. Thank you for the very, very nice <clears throat> talks. I have a very quick question for Jeff. About the very last um, slide you mm -hmm. showed about the adaptation uh, for space life, let's say, does this imply that people that was adapted to live in space will have some trouble going back to Earth or going to Earth and need training and space suits or something like that? Well, I think, I mean, we, NASA, I know, speaks a lot about not just um, space adaptation, but re-adaptation to, to 1G post-flight. Um, and I'm not sure how, well, I think that we've been fairly conservative here, but I mean that some people are, who are, have colonization thoughts or one way to Mars, you know, considerations, uh, don't worry about re-adaptation. But in, in uh, the foreseeable future, yes, I think there'll, there'll be questions about re-adaptation for sure. Keeping in mind that everything that I think we've seen from these little tiny snapshots, these, these windows of, of exposure to micro G and readaptation, uh, certainly in, in non human animals that, that come back to be studied behaviorally, um, the vestibular system and, and the associated processes show enormous plasticity. And I think, to me, one of the lessons learned about from this research is that um, vestibular function is something which is maintained, it's not imprinted. Um, and, and established developmentally. It's something which is a, a part of ongoing uh, maintenance. So I think we see lots of, of readaptation and lots of, of signs of, of things hanging on for, for surprising amounts of time in our bones and our bodies and our brains as well. Coming to that, I think it's important to realize that um, it, as we saw, apparently we can stand even 105 degrees or 110 degrees <laughs> if you're dry freeze. Um, but freeze right, sorry. Uh, but uh, the gravity is the, the most fundamental uh, constant 
throughout evolution of these billions of years of mm -hmm. Earth. Uh, it has been cold, warm, dry, wet, whatever. Uh, so we, ha we were able to adapt to these changes, but actually gravity is the only sole constant. And the, the most simple creatures, they all, have, even plants, have gravity sensors to, to grow up to the right direction. So gravity is the most fundamental thing. So I know you, you say it's a question of adaptation, but to my belief, um, and like also the logo of Asgardia, uh, so the bottom line is actually the, the, uh, referring to, I mean, bottom uh, circle is referring to artificial gravity. Uh, whether it will be one G, half a G, uh, one third of G, but we need G yes. to mm -hmm. continue as a yeah, species. Yeah, what, what I find remarkable, I mean, one way we, one could, in theory, develop a system where you have a, a, an absolutely dependable cue, like <laughs> gravity, is you say, well, at a certain point of development, we'll just imprint on this, lock it in, and we don't need gravity receptors in the sense that, that or, or a system to, to adjust all the time. It's always there, we'll just we'll do it once, but we don't do that. We have, in, yeah. in plants and animals, we have sensors that are constantly monitoring and responding there to There you it. have a point, indeed. Yeah. I think it's wonderful, but it's just it's one of these patterns in nature I think we should And it has been shown with when rats were spin around in a centrifuge when during gestation that their uh, the gravity detectors have been have a different size than, than the, the control. So indeed, as you say from the beginning, when there's a, a shift in gravity paradigm, we somehow yeah. adapt. So eventually, when we may migrate, and you have to think like, where will humanity be in 100,000 years when we left, perhaps, or when a certain group left Earth, and there will be less and less and less gravity, that indeed we may develop a different uh, type of person. Yeah. But okay, that's... We will and in the meantime, maybe a different type of cerebellum, a slightly different true. kind of hippocampus, different yeah. Yeah, But it's true that what you say, uh, actually, what we also saw from our experiments with the cosmonauts before and after space flight, the brain is so tremendously plastic and so adaptive to new paradigms that, and it's coping with it. So, mm -hmm. uh, where I mean, when I grew up, I was told after the age of 18, it's it fixed. <laughs> yeah, forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, you only go, you go only go back, um, and there is no neuroplasticity. Right. But there is so much neuroplasticity. You just have to look at the right, in the right spot. Right. Okay, I've talked enough. Questions. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, very, very simple question, sir. But, um, no such thing. Are, are you saying, basically, let's not worry, let's get up there, um, we're going to change, it's going to change us, we don't quite know what the changes will be, but they, we must see them positively, because it's going to be our evolutionary uh, pathway to somewhere else. I mean, is that in sum what you're saying? You're, you're, you're very upbeat about it, I love it, it's fantastic, but is, is that the, the bottom line? It's okay. Get over it. <laughs> I, it, it, sound too, it sounds too cavalier when you, um, and, I, and I don't mean to, say, to sound that cavalier, but, um, but yes. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you, wouldn't, you, were, you would not hold your microphone like that if you would not be adaptive to situation. I mean, a hundred thousand years ago, we were already walking around. We didn't have microphones, but what, something else. But so the fact that we are here the way we are is the fact that we adapt. Can you give us some idea to what we might adapt? And what, what might we become? I, I'm, I'm not envisioning, when, when I make those remarks, I'm not envisioning um, and there, you know, these science fiction characters that I've read about, and they're, they're very exciting. Um, in terms of what might be become, but I, I think what I'm, I'm, what this experience of, of coming to this meeting and a and, and little bit of thinking I did about it that when I started having this transformation, is I think I started to switch from a norm to appreciating the variance that we already have, um, and then thinking back to that Previc picture of the of the infant inside its mother, and, and depending on the, the placement of, of her uterus and, and the placenta and all the things that, that vary can determine handedness. Handedness determines some aspects of cognitive function. These are very, very, very modest things I'm talking about. But, and, in, and in practice, of course, I'm, I'm terribly interested and concerned about the ethics of all of this work. And, and there are boundaries to, to, but I would sort of freely say, you know, we, we could uh, entertain this change. But I think we, we can shift from, from expecting 
um, life to proceed right around a, a, a 1G Earth normal norm to it's a more variable environment and everything about the environment changes what we do and how we do it. That is going to change our brains and our behavior. It's going to happen. I way. have a, a, a question for you, trying to answer your question. Um, the person who just... Uh, have you seen the, the movie um, with Matt Damon, uh, Downsizing? No, I haven't adapted any, any, to that. Anyone <laughs> in the audience? It, it, it's about uh, making very small people. And I believe in about 40 to 50 years, we will be able to actually make that a reality. Uh, the the CRISPR-Cas, um, ethically debatable at this point, of course. It will change the world. It will, it, it, it will open up opportunities. And if you look back at history, everything, every new technology that provides a new opportunity, a new advantage, will eventually be used and applied, even if, if there's some transition time for, for uh, the ethical uh, debate that is needed. But eventually it will be used and, and the Pandora's box has been opened. The Chinese professor has made HIV-free children from, from the parents with HIV. We, and it is way too early, of course. We have to figure out the ethics and how it really works. But eventually CRISPR is going to change uh, space exploration. We're going to make small people who are much easier to, to transport and we make them hiber hibernate and, and things like this. So if we're uh, terraforming Mars or, or looking really into the future, we should really take that into account and that's not happening. That's, that's funny. And Larry and, and uh, Jack have smaller centrifuges. <laughs> <laughs> True. Is it? Microphone up front, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Eliyahu Munoz, the Guardian from the Guardian. I have a question. I, I'm very aware the, uh, the next step of the humanity is to preserve the human, like, like race. But uh, regard, regarding to the, to the experience that the last 30 years with the, the, first, uh, the first procedure that the, that the Dr. Brown from the United Kingdom uh, started with the, with the in vitro or, or that kind of procedure. With the, with the time, we know what happened, the, uh, the, uh, the difficult situation with more than five million of people. They, they don't know where it's coming from. Where in the next procedure, like the artificial bone, uh, boats and everything, how, what, what do you think to uh, avoid to the deterioration, degradation and the, and the, the, the generation of the human risk for that kind of procedure? Because now, we are, in this moment in the world, where there are more than five million of people split. They don't know where it's coming from. And we know, and we are aware, into the DNA, the people have the real manner for their biology fathers. Do you know? And many problems of them coming from the biology father, but they don't know where they're coming from. We had the experience in the last 30 years how you can avoid this for the future, for another kind of procedure that, like that. I think it's, it's really important to, to address this problem. Um, not sure if I have the answer to that question right now. I think you, you see changes in legislation around this. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, if you look at, um, uh, you cannot be an anonymous donor anymore because people want to know who their, fa their biological father is. Yeah, for example, in the United Kingdom, just one person had 200, 215 child. Yes. This is the, 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 the big problem for the, the generation of the DNA for the people. Yes, of you course. Know. You have to, to, to put limits on those amounts. In the Netherlands, it's 25. Uh, but still, there are some people who, who work around it and who, who fraud and still make 100 uh, children. So that, that wouldn't be ideal. So, so um, those limits are, are for a good reason. I don't know if it should be 25. It sounds a lot better than 200, of course. Yeah. So okay. legislation should, should really take care of those problems. That's good. Well, work, I'm working with like, like 30 years for research, that kind of problem with the, with the Dr. Brown bec uh, in all the world. And there are five million of people split they don't have coming, we're coming from, from. And many of that kind of people, they have big problems, the health problem. 
only the, the real person can help them is the father or biological father, but they don't know coming from, you know? Uh, this is the... the there are uh, the, the new de uh, DNA banking methods, mm -hmm. you, they don't even know, they don't even need the, the biological father to say, well, I, it, it, it's me. If they can find uh, through de DNA banking just a relative, um, um, a nephew or a mother or a sister or anyone, they, they can find out, okay, it was this person who is the father, so they don't need to cooperate. That's, that, that's ethically also complicated, of course, but uh, there are options for those five million people. I saw a question behind. Yep. Yeah. And also the, on the second row is a question. Well, um, I was interested by your uh, experiment to have a birth in orbit. Um, you know that several women these days have underwater births. Uh, I wonder if there is already a biological or other difference between the mothers who do it in the dry and mothers that do it in the water. And from that, maybe you conclude what happens when you do it in zero G. Uh, we, we've been talking to, to uh, obstetrician experts uh, who did the research on, on, the, on those differences. I, I don't know the details by heart. Um, but there would not be, it, it, it matters a lot if you have your first delivery or your second or your third. So that's why we have to, to stay on the safe side to start with and then uh, find out if that does not, would not cause any problem at all, then we, we could move on to, to uh, other variations. Uh, but for example, the, the position in, in which you give labor, the most natural position is, is, is like this. And, and we are used to, uh, in, in, in the Western uh, world, we are used to lying down like this. That's not even natural. And, and, but, but people are adapt adaptive in, in, in that way as well. But there are no big, that, that's definitely not a bottleneck for, for the experiment. The, the, um, the sensory stimulation that uh, an infant receives during vaginal birth turns out to be uh, crucial for its making its transition from the, the uterine world to the external world. And if, it's, um, if they're handled too gently um, during the birth process, they actually can suffer. So in, in this rat preparation that I was showing you, we'd actually, that ground-based work was all about reconstructing vaginal births with, with little devices that we could simulate the, the number and the force of contractions, the temperature changes, the tactile stimulation, this long list of things. If we minimized all of it and did these super, super gentle births and then clamped the cord, the babies just expired. They never gasped, they didn't struggle, they just expired. Um, I did a presentation of this at, at a, a small conference and there were a couple of British um, obstetricians in, in the group and they went wild when I presented these data because there had just been two drownings of these water babies in in Europe where they were doing these, these extremely gentle births and they were linking the, the, uh, the, those data with these. So the, even with cesarean sections, if, um, when I've spoken to um, the obstetricians and nurses who work on them, they're actually very, very stimulating, especially to these little bikini uh, incisions and the physicians are, I'm told, will press so hard on the mother's abdomen they lift themselves off the floor to squeeze these babies out. So they're, and they, of course, they're preceded by Pitocin treatments and, and simulating, or stimulating, um, you know, really vigorous contractions. So uh, it would be an issue, but I think that yeah. it, it would be manageable for sure. Without yeah, no C-sections in space, that's uh, causing a, a lot of other problems. Yeah, lots. Yeah. So we, you want to prevent that. Mm -hmm. There was a question over there, yes, in the second row. Oh. Paul Schoffelen, University of Maastricht. I have one question for you, Jeffrey. Does this uh, astro uh, neurology does mean that it, for all us humans that our development, our neurological developments from the birth onward and the, the vestibular system is dependent on the period that our mothers carry us? So it's also uh, I think something that is very important for us on Earth how we develop, not only for space. I didn't, I didn't quite, quite follow your question. Louder in the microphone, yeah. please. Maybe I should, it, should hold the microphone better. If you have this astro neurology, uh, then you uh, say that the way that you are carried in the mother's womb affects your uh, development of your vestibular system and your neurology, 
and of course a lot of people who have a problem with uh, vestibular systems and neurology. Does this mean that this uh, same astral neurology has affected them? So it's uh, like a birth defect, if you will? I, I guess it would depend on, on the uh, exact syndromes that you're imagining or, or know of with the, um, those birth defects. But the, I was just, I had just gone to this new, this new framework for myself and, and this is saying that we should expect in a, in a totally novel environment, of whether it's a, in a micro gravity of a space flight or on a, a one-third G um, on a, a smaller planet. But maybe it comes it's, to it's us It's going to be faster. different. So uh, no. if this is a new direction of thinking. Mm, for me, yes. It's, it's a good remark you make. Uh, but actually, I deal with vestibular patients, so with patients who are dizzy. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that you can really easily make a, a link between gestation mm -hmm. and uh, vestibular problems most people develop at the age of 50 years old. Actually, I mean, that's the average age of festival, I mean, dizziness. Uh, however, uh, you, to you showed me this uh, left-right asymmetry, and I have been burgling, uh, I mean, uh, really thinking very l uh, hard about why is there an asymmetry if you test people left and right with this very traditional caloric test, so putting water in the ears and then see to the festival re uh, response. There has been a dominant asymmetry, which is significant. And mm -hmm. then we think, OK, we are symmetric. We are built symmetric. I mean, left, right should be fine. Mm -hmm. And it is not statistically. Not. Mm -hmm. So I think, why is one system dominant? But you gave me the answer. Yeah. So thank you very much indeed. So, so I think there is no r link between gestational issues. Um, but again, the question to this also to your colleague from, from the UK. Um, I don't know, uh, presumably there are laws which govern our physiology. Like there is a, the law of Poiseuille who is saying how the, vessel, the blood vessels are opening and closing with the R to the fourth um, power, which means that we can really, we, sh we can still have arms and limbs and have a normal bloodstream because it is being regulated by these kind of like physical laws. Uh, but it can be very well be uh, that in the future we will have bigger or smaller vestibular systems uh, that our muscles be, will be more pronounced or just less pronounced. If we if we are all the time in space flight, we, it, we should not have so many so much muscles because there is no need to stand up all the time. So our physiology will be quite determined by how we will in which type of environment we will be living. And the exam example of a spaceman, a Superman, uh, is very nice. Indeed, he's uh, a Krypton. What was the G level at Krypton? I think it was like three or five or something. Okay, so suppose 5G. I mean, if you're raised in 5G, then you're a, a big, heavy, tall person. So Get smaller. The same will be if we will be living in 0.3G, for instance, then we will be having different physiology at a certain extent. It will take hundreds or thousands of years, but this is what I definitely like about Asgardia. It obliges us to think where will be humanity be in 100,000 years? I mean, that's really a challenging question. It's fantastic to think about it. There was a question in the second row, which okay, I thought was one to miss. 5G. Uh, I mean, if you were raised in 5G, then you're a, a big, heavy, tall person. So Get smaller. The same Hello, <coughs> my name is Krishnan and Krishnan, and I was fascinated by the vestibular variance that you were talking about. And I'm not sure if any research has been done in this manner specifically, but what I was thinking about because we were talking about vestibular dysfunction, also there is like hyperfunction of the vestibular, for especially those uh, like looking into like yoga and using practices to really create these different types of um, physical movements that have very strong cognitive um, uh, effects, uh, lower anxiety, like all these different um, aspects. And I just wonder whether we can practice um, some of these types of manual manipulations ahead of time, since there is such uh, plasticity, to create uh, a situation where we would then be able to manage um, when we go out into space, because we already have practices here that we could supplement and, and, and kind of look into. And I'm just not sure if there's any research yet there, but it just seems like there's a lot of potential to look look into these um, techniques where people have already um, known, oh yes, uh, we effects, are affected uh, by the way we walk, and we are affected by um, ways we perceive reality um, based on practice. how we're affected with gravity. So these types of, of upside down poses are very, very valuable in terms of, uh, not just from a physical point of view, but from an emotional uh, point of view, from a um, psychological point of view, and I just feel like there's a huge arena of research.
research there that could uh, uh, help us understand whether kind of these supplemental just physiologically, research, but also yet, perhaps but just even just like assisted a uh, technologically, like we have with like a pacemaker to help us uh, practice some things that we may not be able to get in life. So it just seems like a nice plan. That's such a really creative idea. That's a really fabulous insight. Upside down poses are very, very valuable. It's true that you say that there is a lot of physical point of view, but I can also agree that there's psychological predictability. And I just want to do on Earth or even explain yourself and then not being sick in space or being sick in space. It's actually not really much. And actually, it's also not very popular on technologically. Like we have to try to find out if they will be sick in space because if they are found to be, oh, you will be sick in space. Okay, we'll take another one. And then after 50 years of you, so it's kind of like difficult. But still, there are no models on Earth to predict the space motion. Yes, one, the success paradigm. The biofeedback system that that Larry had referenced early on was was one example. The astronauts were very non-compliant. They were uninterested in saying, "Well, I get sick. I will try this." Just to respond respond to that last 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 question: Are there simple cognitive effects that you can experiment with? And, and see what cognitive effect that is. It leads me to question my old friend Jeff. Was, was you mentioned briefly the vestibular alter alteration of that, that was related to cognitive dis dis dysfunction. Did you say a word or two about it? I, um, no. This, <laughs> the, uh, because it was not from, from my research, it's from this, uh, the Smith and, and Zhang paper. And uh, that was the paper, a, it's a review article, um, and not a, um, an experiment, but what they were doing is, is going through these, uh, these galvanic uh, stimuli. The literature, from what, as they were reviewing it, is heavily weighted, as I said, toward the um, spatial learning and memory. Uh, but okay. Well, to say another word about a field that I don't know about, no. Uh, handedness. This, handedness. <laughs> there is a significant the, uh, literature on handedness. It was I've never heard my research referred to in the context that you mentioned. Paper. Most of it and, had to uh, do with that things was the like that it's a the, review uh, article. Uh, and not a, Sun, uh, the sunlight versus, uh, versus non-sunlight during uh, the uh, first the three months of course. The literature from what this is as they were our our old friend Norman heavily Cash was it uh, for the uh, uh, spatial learning. Testosterone uh, levels in utero. But, okay. Well, to say another word about a field like determining right-handed right versus left-handed. Well, this critic analysis, it means it's an extremely integrative review. And I just mentioned once when I was, that was a paper that was the summarizing part of his observations is that he actually, by the, uh, as he developed that section of this review paper, links it very tightly also to uh, anti-gravitational the sensor when the two legs is also being part of this, this handedness. Well, Fred Prevec was a very well, is a very well respected researcher. In he should be, yeah. He's really very, very impressive. <laughs> Well, this critic analysis, it means it's extremely integrated. I'm asking for Kirill Pletner, editor-in-chief of an Aerospace Journal. He's wondering if any of you today would be willing to become fathers of babies born into space. Thank you. Of course. Fred is a very well is very well It would on the mother. He should be. Um, but I, I think that's a, that's a great responsibility. I mean, you you uh, you need to be an example in, in, in several ways. And, and being a, a founder of a company who is doing research should not be should not have this privilege. So I would want to, but I would reject because that, that wouldn't be uh, ethically right. Thank you. Of course, I would like to to of be course. part of that step in evolution. But then, the mother. I wasn't on the speaker, so. But I, I think that's a, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you, uh, you need to be an example in, in, in several ways. And, and being a, a founder of a company who is doing research you. should not be. Uh, you should not have this journalist. privilege. So um, I would want to, but company, I would reject um, because that is uh, how many <laughs> that would be a portion of uh, women in your company. Right. Thank you. But uh, and of course, also, I would like do you actually to have any women who would that be interested in giving birth in space? But then the mother. It just strikes me that you know, <laughs> childbirth is such a difficult and complex um, thing. I was on this and then the right. idea to get the women into space to do it. And just such a male sort of idea. And I just wonder if any women would. 
It's good. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering about I get what you what you say, and, and it's a fully legitimate question. And we've been uh, eager to to get a really good balance in 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 the the, the people that support us. And now I think it's 30% uh, uh, female in the, in in the population that that people are that are supporting us. And we we, still, we, we always try to raise that percentage. But, but this, this feels like a minimum. And do we have people who are interested in, in delivering a baby? Many. Women rather than people? Yeah, uh, women, definitely. But, w but uh, we are, of course, already thinking about selection procedures. And um, it, it's very important that, that participants not only match all the medical criteria, psychological criteria, uh, but also the, the, their motives. I mean, they shouldn't. They should never do this for for fortune and fame or something. Being a, a very special person, uh, if it happens, being part of the group. Thank you. I'm reluctantly going to uh, to, to close this this roundtable session because I think it's to, to adhere to the schedule. We're we're here to talk and and interact. Be happy to do that. I still have to make a couple of Please, remarks. Please, and we need some, some time for announcements. I'll take the, but thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, wonderful for you. Um, so I want to definitely thank all the speakers of uh, this afternoon. It was a magnificent uh, top-level session. I really loved it tremendously. Uh, I have a couple of remarks also. In your uh, back, there's this magazine room. And the next issue will be uh, partly d dedicated to actually the, this uh, conference and to the talks given during this conference. So I kindly ask you uh, to take this opportunity to send in by the end of October uh, a manuscript which will be published in this uh, uh, journal. Uh, uh, in this journal, it doesn't have to be novel work. I mean, it's not like in the other journals that it has to be unique and novel and never published work. So, but please grab this opportunity because it's definitely going. To, uh, it has a large spread. Another remark I want to make is at the at the very last day at the very last session conference on Wednesday, there will be three prizes given, uh, prizes given to uh, the best young students' uh, presentations or posters. So uh, that's still there. So there is a, a science committee who will be uh, being a jury and looking at the posters as well as the presentations and give uh, prizes to the young students uh, on this conference. Uh, as you know, the gala dinner tomorrow is uh, included in the, in the conference, so you are all warm and welcome to come to the, to the gala dinner. There will be buses leaving tomorrow uh, afternoon, I mean at the end of the sessions. Finally, um, I would like to kindly invite you now to grab a drink and look at the posters and get together for the next couple of hours. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Great, I really enjoyed it. So now I can speak freely. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, likewise. And, and it, was, um, it was also interesting that, that, that you know uh, Eva Wonka so well. Like she's, she's the best, and I just feel like she's the best. Yeah. Yeah. Old friends I've never seen.